The Black Train Parents knew nothing about being a kid. It was just that simple. They were old and had been adults forever. They had no idea what it was like to be a kid. All they knew was how to make a kid's life really hard and miserable. There were too many rules and too many punishments. That was certainly the case in Benjamin Freeling's mind. His parents were devoted to just making his life as hard as they could. He was never allowed to have any fun. They always yelled at him and made him do those stupid chores. They grounded him a lot, too. Sheesh. Things must have been really boring when his parents were his age. If they were that strict, then fun must not have been invented yet back then. Well, one thing was for sure. Benjamin wasn't about to take this lying down. He would show his boring old parents a thing or two. How would they feel if he just disappeared and never came back? Ha! That would show them. They couldn't ground him if he wasn't there. He wouldn't have to do those stupid chores if he wasn't there. So he wouldn't be there. They could find someone else to torture and torment. He tossed his olive green duffel bag on his bed and began to shuffle about. He went into his drawers and began to get some undershorts. Yep, and that was all he would bring. Forget socks and undershirts. His mother always made him wear them. What was the point? Stupid rules. Benjamin then began to grab some t-shirts and jeans to throw into the bag. He didn't even bother to fold them neatly. He simply shoved them into his big bag in crinkled clumps. And went a pair of boots in case it rained. And he had sneakers on his feet already. He grabbed a jacket and tossed it beside the bag. Nighttime would be a little cool after all. After packing the items he thought he'd need, he went into the closet. He dug his way through the stuff on the floor until he hit the far corner. Finally, he found what he was looking for. With an aha! It was a jar that he had kept hidden under his sleeping bag. It was full of money that he had saved from his allowance in the occasional odd jobs. He had spent a whole summer on a paper route, mowing lawns, and the previous autumn raking leaves to make the majority of the money saved in the jar. The rest was an accumulation of 50 cents a week for his completed chores. In total, he probably had a whole $30 in the jar in small bills and change. That was more than enough to get him where he needed to go, wherever that was. Everything seemed to be in order. There wasn't a single bit of space left in his duffel bag for any more items. On went his black jacket and baseball cap from his favorite team. It was black with the orange oriole on the front. It didn't matter if he did live further inland. He was a Baltimore Orioles fan. What exactly was an oriole anyway? Never mind, it didn't matter. It had nothing to do with playing the game of baseball and it had nothing to do with his plans. He pulled a piece of bubble gum out of the container on his dresser and popped it into his mouth. It was his last piece. He had gotten it out of a pack of bubblegum cards. Like most boys his age, he bought a pack of bubblegum baseball cards every week with a bit of his allowance. Baseball cards and candy. Ah, that was a taste of heaven. That's what he believed. Heaven was baseball and bubblegum that had a slight taste of cardboard and tinfoil. Now he was ready. Benjamin opened his window and tossed his bag out. Then out went the jar. He was very careful with the old pickle jar and did not break it. He leaned over the sill almost completely to gently plop it onto the soft grass. It was a success. It didn't break. Now all he had to do was get his self out. He slunk back into the room and began to work himself back out backwards. It wouldn't be a far drop, and it wasn't. He found his footing in the grass rather easily. He then eased the window down until it was almost closed. Satisfied with that, he picked up his pickle jar and his duffel bag. The bag was slung over his shoulder and rested on his back. As for the jar, he placed it in a basket on the back of his bicycle. He then wheeled the bicycle out of the yard as quietly as possible. Once he was on the sidewalk, he straddled the banana seat and got into a smooth ride. The night was rather dark. Thankfully, the street lamp made the sidewalk and empty roads as clear as day. 
Not much activity was going on at this time of night. Everyone was watching the television, listening to the radio, or preparing to go to bed. He was able to go undetected. He wouldn't have cared if someone had caught him, but it would have been rather bothersome if someone had telephoned his parents. It would ruin his plans. It took a full 20 minutes to reach his destination. With much less traffic than during the day, he was able to speed there rather quickly without having to stop at all the intersections. He slowed his bicycle in front of the building that was the old train station. He'd have to bid his bike a farewell. He couldn't take it on the train. It was a pity, really. That bicycle had been very dependable. It was like leaving a good friend behind. But it just couldn't be helped. He leaned the bicycle against the outside wall and gathered up the pickle jar, and he readjusted his duffel bag. It was so quiet and desolate. He almost wondered if anyone would even be inside as he pushed the door open. A bell over the door was disturbed, and it let out a ring. Well, at least the door wasn't locked. Good evening, came the call from the front desk as the station master fiddled with the chalkboard containing the train schedules. He was a tall man with sandy brown hair. His blue cap covered most of it. He wore a blue coat with black and yellow striped cuffs. On his hands, he wore crisp white gloves. It was almost a pity to touch the chalk with them. Just make yourself comfortable. I'll be with you in just one second. How much is a ticket? Benjamin asked. He flopped the bag onto a bench and approached the desk with his pickle jar. The station master turned his head slightly, but his hair still covered most of the view. It obstructed his face. A boy? Ah, I don't really like dealing with kids. At this time of night, it's mostly adults. It's not good when kids come through this late. You alone? Yeah, I'm big enough, he insisted. I could do it all by myself. Now how much is a ticket? Well, that depends on where you wish to go, boy, the station master replied. My name is Benjamin, he spat. I don't care where I go. I just want to get away from home. Is it that simple? The station master chuckled. No plans at all? I have plans, Benjamin retorted. I'm going to join the circus. Then when I get bigger, I'm going to play with the Orioles. I'm going to be so rich and famous. That'll show everyone. The circus, the station master muttered with a hint of amusement. Despite his statement about disliking children, he seemed to have a soft and gentle nature to his personality and his voice. You got this all figured out, don't you? You gonna answer me, mister? Stuart, the station master chuckled. You can call me Stuart. Now we're on a first name basis. He went silent a moment before pointing to one of the rectangles. If you want to run away to the circus, you'll most likely want this train. The closest circus is here. You got a special talent you plan to do? Benjamin was actually a little surprised that Stuart had told him which train to take. Even though Stuart had yet to look at him, he had to have realized that he was indeed traveling alone. Yet he gave out the information freely. Perhaps he didn't care one way or the other what some kid was doing. I can... Well, I can... Can you do trapeze? Can you walk a tightrope? Can you do fancy acrobatics? Can you tame a lion? I can't do any of that. Maybe I could be a clown. That's easy. A clown, eh? Stuart chuckled. I guess you could do that. You're amusing. But if that doesn't work out, I'm sure every circus needs a stable boy to clean up after the animals. I am not shoveling poop, Benjamin gasped. Well, if it pays, it pays. You'll get to Baltimore quicker if you're being paid. Then you can play with them Blue Jays. Blue Jays? That's Toronto. The Orioles are in Baltimore. Do you even know what an Oriole is? Stuart suddenly asked. That question caught Benjamin a little off guard. Well, not really. I know it's a bird, but that's about it. Why, do you know what an Oriole is? Oh, it's a beautifully colored bird. It's only a little thing. They mate for life and use other more aggressive birds to protect their nests. 
That doesn't sound like something to name a baseball team after, Benjamin remarked. But I guess if Toronto can have Blue Jays, then Baltimore can have Orioles. The train leaves at about 6.30 a.m., Stuart stated. So you have quite a long wait ahead of you. You sure you want to stick around? I'll just stay here all night. But is that the only train leaving? Stuart put down his chalk a moment and examined the board. I'm afraid that's the only train you'll be able to take. Even if you wanted to go randomly anywhere, that would be the earliest train to catch. He crossed his arms and tapped his finger on his sleeve. Yes, that is the only one. What sort of money do you have? I got thirty dollars, Benjamin replied. Thirty dollars, Stuart sighed. He let out an impressed whistle. That's a lot of money for a boy your age, Benjamin. You must have been planning for this a really long time. Benjamin looked his pickle jar of money over. It was a little sad to see all that money have to go away, but he had to do what he had to do. So do I have enough for a ticket? You can certainly buy a ticket for that to get where you're going. Will you sell me one? I suppose I can. If you are for certain, that's what you want. Benjamin put the pickle jar on the counter and waited for Stuart to turn around. However, despite telling him that he would sell him a ticket, he still didn't turn around to follow through. You're stalling. Stuart couldn't help but laugh. This confused Benjamin a little. What was so funny about that? He cocked his head to the side to study the station master's back. Still, Stuart picked up the chalk and continued to write on the board. You consider it stalling? Your train doesn't arrive until 6.30. There's plenty of time for you to get your ticket. Besides, it's amusing to watch you carry around that pickle jar. Benjamin let out a gasp. How did you know it was a pickle jar? Stuart hadn't even looked at it. How did he know? Did he have eyes in the back of his head or something? There are a lot of things I know, Benjamin, Stuart replied simply. I've been around for a long time. I've seen and heard things that you wouldn't even believe. Sometimes even I don't believe it. But your pickle jar is the least amazing of them. Will you be selling me a ticket? If you insist. But there's no point in me giving you a ticket for the morning train, if, in case, you have an interest in taking a later train. Instead of going through that rigmarole, just sit tight until the train arrives. Benjamin let out a sigh and snatched his pickle jar off the counter. He made his way over to the bench and flopped himself beside his duffel bag. Out came another long sigh. Then it was followed by a long silence. The only sound to be heard was Stuart's chalk on the board and the ticking of the wall clock. He looked around. The station was built from dark wood. It was a brownish-gray in color. It was a bit distressed, too. This station was only a small one, after all. It didn't have to be as grand and luxurious as the ones in the big cities. The benches weren't very comfortable, either. Soon, his eyes fell back on Stuart. He seemed to be a scrawny man. He was tall and thin. He wondered if he had a nerdy sort of face. But he talked like he was old. His hair was colored, not white or gray, so perhaps he wasn't as old as he let on. So what you running from, Benjamin? That question came out of nowhere. Benjamin wasn't prepared to answer right away. Anyway, the very sound of Stuart's voice startled him. It had been so quiet until then. Excuse me? You're running away to the circus. Traveling alone? There's trouble at home, isn't there? Of course, it's none of my business, but talking certainly helps the time go by. Better than sitting here in a dead silence. He almost had an urge to tell Stuart to mind his own business, but he was right. The silence was getting on his nerves. It's complicated. You wouldn't understand. Why wouldn't I understand? Stuart asked. You're a grown-up. It's a kid thing. Grown-ups just don't get it. Oh, he replied. I see. We're too old to understand anything about the way kids think. Exactly, 
Benjamin said. Try me anyway, Stuart requested. Maybe you can enlighten me. I like to learn new things. Even if I don't always understand, I like to try. He gave a little chuckle and finally put the chalk down altogether. He started to fiddle and sort some papers. Still, he didn't face the boy. It started to irk Benjamin. Let me guess. You're grounded, Benjamin? Humph, he pouted. Yeah, I'm grounded. For what? Lots of things. My report card wasn't as good as they wanted it. But I'd like to see them try it, Benjamin insisted. Parents don't have to do that stupid homework and listen to boring teachers. This stuff is stupid and pointless. Parents just don't know how hard it is to be a kid. He sighed and crossed his arms more tightly. It was then that his belly began to rumble loudly. Stuart turned his head slightly. Even with a little bit of distance between them, he could hear a tummy rumble as clear as day. Benjamin tried to ignore and hide it by rubbing his belly in an attempt to calm it. I am assuming that you were sent to bed without supper, Stuart said simply. That is one really fierce growl. Sounds like a lion in there. I tried to explain it all to Mom and Dad, but they got mad and sent me to bed without supper, Benjamin admitted. I'm starving. Stuart let out a little chuckle. Didn't you bring anything to snack on? If you're going to run away, you're going to need some snacks. Thirty dollars is a lot of money for a boy your age, but there's no promise that it will get you far. Benjamin's silence was enough to answer his question. Stuart finished with the papers and knelt under the counter. He then reached up to place a lunchbox onto it. There you go, Benjamin, he called. Help yourself to that. That ought to fill your belly. Benjamin perked. Food? His stomach wanted it desperately, and it was hard for him to resist. He hopped off the bench and bounded over to the counter. He reached out to grab the lunchbox, then waited. But what will you eat? Are you sure you want me to have this? Oh, you need it a lot more than I do, Benjamin, Stuart replied. Go ahead and eat as much as you like. Fill that belly. You've got a long night ahead of you and a long ride. It may be the last meal you'll have for a while. Benjamin got on his toes in an attempt to look over the counter. He wasn't quite tall enough to do it as successfully as he had hoped. He still couldn't see Stuart's face. He slid back down to the flats of his feet and brought the lunchbox close to him. He made his way back to the bench and opened it. Inside was a wonderful meal for an empty stomach. There were two loaded sandwiches. They were on white bread. There was ham, cheese, American and Swiss, turkey, lettuce, tomato, mayonnaise, and Lebanon bologna. There was a baggie with three hard-boiled eggs, which included fast food packets of salt and pepper. There was a bag of plain potato chips as well, and another little baggie with two pickle spears. By the smell and look, he could tell they were the exact brand of pickle that came from his pickle jar. And hidden under it all, was a slender glass bottle of soda pop. In reality, Benjamin probably couldn't eat all of this food, but his eyes were much bigger than his stomach, and he was determined to try. As he took a massive bite out of one sandwich, he realized that Stuart had returned to his upright position. He was facing away from him yet again and hanging rolls of tickets on little nooks. He was preparing them for easy grabs when the public came in to buy their tickets. Perhaps that was why Stuart had not sold Benjamin one. Perhaps they just weren't up yet. But nevertheless, Benjamin realized that he had been so enamored with the food that he had missed the possible chance to see Stuart's face. He let out a huff through his nose as his cheeks puffed out to accommodate the mouthful. A small chiming began to commence. A quick look at the clock showed that it was 11 p.m. This was the latest he had ever been out. Except for sleepovers, he had never been away from home past 7.30 p.m. He had always had to be ready for bed by 8.30. He was surprised that he was not tired. Perhaps it was because he was just too hungry to be tired. He ate quickly, hardly waiting for the food to be swallowed before taking a swig of soda to wash it down. Careful, Stuart warned. 
You'll end up choking if you stuff it all down like that. Benjamin gave him a glare. How did he do that? As if to give his reply, he let out a belch. Being the child he was, he didn't bother excusing himself. But Stuart didn't seem to mind. Good eats, eh? My wife can pack me a good meal. I'll tell you what. You're married? Benjamin asked, now without a full mouth. Yep. And she's a lovely one, too. Do you two have kids? We don't have children, Stuart answered. We wanted them, but some things just aren't meant to be. We have each other, and we settle for that. Well, there's always adoption, you know, Benjamin suggested. It seems so obvious to him. If a couple wanted children and couldn't have them, they should adopt. What was so complicated about that? Perhaps one day, the day will come for us to adopt. Right now, things just aren't right. But we're okay with that for now. She sure can pack a big meal. How do you stay so skinny with lunches like this? Stuart chuckled. Oh, I'm just naturally thin and lanky, Benjamin. I suppose it's genetics, metabolism, whatever people want to say. I just don't ever gain weight. Having eaten his fill, Benjamin placed the lunchbox on the floor and sat back. It's probably for the best to not be parents. Parents are so strict and make up stupid rules. Some parents have their reasons, Stuart shrugged. It's just hard for kids to see it. Figures you'd say that. You adults all stick together. Stuart was quiet a moment. He seemed to be lost in thought. The silence was eerie and it made Benjamin uncomfortable. Stuart? You and I, we aren't so different, believe it or not, Stuart finally said. I was a pretty rough kid, too. I used to think a lot like you did. In fact, I think most boys do. There's always that gap between childhood and adulthood, and it's hard for the two to meet. Adults have seen the world and are trying to make life a little easier for the young. The young, as always, wish to learn through the school of hard knocks. It's just how things are. I wanted to run away and join the circus when I was a boy, too. Did you ever do it? Benjamin asked. Almost did. I was a real terror to my parents. I put them through a lot of stress and heartache with my careless antics. When they tried to be parents, I held it against them. I didn't see what they were trying to do. All I knew was I didn't like to be in trouble, and I didn't like people making a big deal out of my fun. See, that's what I mean, Benjamin shouted. That's exactly what I've been trying to say. Sometimes things that you think are fun stop being fun when someone gets hurt, Stuart finally stated. My best friend had gotten a BB gun. We thought it would be tons of fun to take it in the backyard and shoot it at tin cans and paper targets. All was fine and dandy until we decided that we wanted to play big game hunters. We shot at two birds and a neighbor's cat. All three died because of our fun. And a few days later, a whole nest of baby birds died because we had killed their parents. Not to mention that the neighbor was distraught over her dead cat. That was all in the name of fun. But it wasn't fun anymore. Benjamin thought on that for a few minutes. The story sounded so like him. He would have shot BB guns. He would have probably shot at birds, too. But the thought had never really occurred to him that his actions could have serious consequences to others. Shooting at a bird could have been funny, but the thought of the bird dying had never registered. Death wasn't fun, nor was it funny. He saw where Stuart was going with that, but on the other hand, Benjamin hadn't killed anything that he knew of. I guess I see what you're saying. Killing some animals would definitely be something to get in trouble over. But what about all this other nonsense? The chores, the early curfew, the stupid grade expectations. What of all that? We take our experiences and we learn from them. Are you really that angry with your parents? Benjamin crossed his arms again. You're not going to talk me out of this, Stuart. I don't want my parents anymore. I don't want any parents. I can take care of everything all by myself. I don't need anybody. 
To that, Stuart fell silent again. There would be no reasoning with the boy, it seemed. His mind had already been made up. And Benjamin was a stubborn sort. It was almost sad. Still, Benjamin wasn't his child, and he shouldn't have cared so much. His job was to sell the tickets and watch the train station. But it beat being silent. Benjamin stretched himself along the bench. He could feel himself growing so heavily tired. He used his duffel bag for a pillow as he felt his eyes drooping. Sleep seemed so wonderful. But just as he was about to doze, he started to hear a sound, and the clock began to chime once more. Midnight had come, and the chugging of a train in the distance could be heard. A long wail of the whistle sounded, alerting the station of the arrival. Benjamin shot upright and looked around. Stuart pulled a pocket watch from his vest and looked over the time. Ah, it's right on the schedule. It never fails. Benjamin got up and wandered to the other side of the station to peer out at the train pulling in. Steam hissed from the engine as it came to a stop. Then another loud whistle sounded. Benjamin couldn't help but hold his breath at the sight of the train. It didn't look like any of the trains he would see cruising the tracks throughout the day. He didn't know trains like this even came through this area. It was a shiny black train. It looked almost as if it was brand new. Wherever this train was from, they took very good care of it. Rather than sharp and angular, it was more rounded and inviting. The light from the station reflected and glimmered off the finish. As Benjamin looked down the track, he was amazed at how large this train was. He almost wondered if it had made a correct stop. Surely, he couldn't want anything from a podunk little town like this. Cars and cars were strewn together. He couldn't even really see the caboose from where he was standing. It was as if the train vanished partway back into the night fog. It was funny, really. Benjamin hadn't realized how foggy the night had become. But how would he? He had been inside for the last few hours. There was no question about it. This train was beautiful, and it looked as if every car was part of a luxury line. The morning train wouldn't be anything like this, and he would likely never get to ride on a luxury line if he waited. In he rushed and grabbed his bag. He took a few steps backwards to regain his balance as he slung the bag onto his back over his shoulder. I want to go on that train, he shouted. Forget the 630 train. I want to take this one wherever it's going. Are you sure you want to take this train, Benjamin? Stuart asked, still looking at his watch. This train may not take you anywhere near a circus, and it probably won't take you to Baltimore either. Maybe not, but it looks really fancy. I bet it's going somewhere really snazzy. Will my money get me a ticket onto this train? You're going to tell me that it's too expensive, aren't you? It is a luxury line, Stuart replied. It is also extremely expensive to ride. I don't think your $30 would even be enough to cover it. Benjamin's jaw dropped that statement. To him, that was a lot of money. Who in the world in this place could afford a train like this? People here don't make a huge amount of money, Stuart. What is a train like this doing here? If it's that expensive to ride, what is the point? What will it take for me to ride this train? This train doesn't stay very long, Stuart explained. It passes through briefly at midnight. It will be leaving in a few short minutes. It's only here to pick up anyone who wants to ride. And I do, Benjamin shouted. He tossed the pickle jar towards the counter. He could see as he turned around that Stuart was turning to intercept the jar. But despite his curiosity that had plagued him for hours, Benjamin didn't bother to look at the station master. Out he went towards the train. Benjamin, Stuart called. Benjamin, wait! Take it all! Benjamin called back and leapt onto the train. This was it. He was on this beautiful train. 
just as he had imagined. The inside was absolutely gorgeous. However, there seemed to be something odd about it as well. The cards had very soft, pillowed walls with pink satin fabric. The seats were also very welcoming. It was first class only. Benjamin had never experienced anything first class before. He could feel his heart leaping up into his throat as he thought about finally experiencing it. There were other passengers on the train. None seemed interested in getting off the train. Most of them seemed to ignore Benjamin altogether. No one offered him a place and no one greeted him. That was just as well. Benjamin wasn't comfortable talking to these strangers anyway. The passengers all seemed a little strange for his taste. They seemed pale. Some even looked almost green in the skin. Some of the passengers were really creepy and ugly. Some looked really sick. Despite the luxury of the cars, nobody was smiling. Everyone seemed to be lost in his or her own little world, or miserable. How could anyone be miserable on a beautiful train like this? Carefully, Benjamin removed the bag from his shoulder and shuffled towards an empty seat. He placed the bag next to the seat on the floor and sat down. He sank a little into the seat, since it was so pillowed and fluffy. It was like nothing he'd ever sat in before. He wanted to just sit back and relax. He wanted to fall asleep in this welcoming chair. But a part of him was still tense and unsure. After all, he had never traveled on a train by himself before. After a few minutes, the car door opened and in came a tall and skinny man dressed in a black conductor's outfit. He jingled as he took heavy steps until he stood over Benjamin. He held down a hand and motioned his fingers as though he expected something to be placed in it. Ticket, please. Huh? This was all that Benjamin could reply. Ticket? You need a ticket. Benjamin stared at the waiting hand and gulped. He had thrown the money at Stewart, but he had never gotten his ticket. Do you have a ticket? Please don't throw me off the train, Benjamin pleaded. I have to get out of here. Please, just please don't throw me off the train. No ticket? Are you some sort of gate crasher boy? The conductor asked. No, I... I... No one rides for free, boy. Benjamin bit his lower lip and peered up at the conductor. His hopes were that he could pull off the sappy puppy dog eyes and win the man over. But when his eyes fell upon the conductor's face, he ended up biting his lip hard before letting out a scream. Under the uniform, the hat, the gloves, it was a skeleton. Peering down at him was a scolding skull. Unable to contain his fear, Benjamin fell out of his seat and began to crawl, almost like a crab backwards. What are you? You're not human. Not a single passenger seemed to react. It was as if they didn't even realize that he was there. They were suspended in whatever realm their mind was in. They were virtually furniture within furniture. The conductor began to step towards Benjamin again. Every step brought the jingles of keys and chains. Soon, Benjamin was trapped against the wall of the car, and the conductor stood over him once more. So you want to ride that badly, do you? No one rides for free. This train is a very expensive train to ride. Being so young and so stupid, I suppose we can help you out. Stay away from me, Benjamin shouted as he shielded his face. If you have no ticket, then we can put you to work. You just might find better company in the engineer than in these stiffs. These people will not talk to you. He let out a raspy laugh as he leaned down and grabbed Benjamin by the back of the shirt. The boy flailed and cried out in fear. Put me down, he demanded. Put me down. Where are you taking me? Stop. Help. Help me. Someone. Stuart. The conductor let out another laugh. 
Boy, the station master can do nothing for you now. You've boarded the black train. There's no getting off the black train. Its passengers are on it until the very last stop. Benjamin was carried through three different cars before finally reaching the very large engine. The conductor dropped the boy to the ground on his behind. He stood guard at the only entrance and crossed his arms. If skulls could leer, that was exactly what he did. He could feel the tears starting to well up in his eyes. Still, he tried to push them back, despite his fear. But then, he got a good look at the engineer. He was more terrifying than the conductor. The engineer was dressed in blue and white overalls, a red shirt, and a red and white bandana around his neck. His sleeves were rolled up over massive, hairy arms. His fingers looked more like mutated cloven hooves. He had two massive fingers and a thumb on each hand. The head was more terrifying still. Instead of a human head, another skull was present. Only, this skull wasn't a human skull. It was the skull of a large bull, horns and all. The teeth were long and pointed, as if this bull had eaten much flesh. Want to drive, Benjamin? the hellish voice taunted. It then let out an echoing laugh as Benjamin let out a scream. He got up to make his escape, but the conductor still blocked his path. When he turned back to the engineer, he was shoveling up a pile of coal and tossing it into the blazing firebox. The fires could only further the image of the hell that Benjamin had gotten himself into. Not too many people come here to visit this poor old engineer. Tell your fireman that he can take the rest of the night off, the conductor said. I got you a replacement. If he's as stubborn in his work as he is in his personality and mouth, then he'll be better than your current fireman. Black as coal is a nice color for him, the engineer cackled. He tossed the shovel at Benjamin. He caught it long ways and fell back onto his bottom again from the force. Get to work, Benjamin! The shovel is too heavy, Benjamin cried out. Get up and get to work, the engineer roared. Benjamin shot to his feet and strained to lift the heavy shovel. It didn't feel like any shovel he'd ever held before. It was no wonder the engineer's arms were so big. Even in small amounts, lifting this shovel worked the muscles. He didn't want to imagine what the firemen looked like. He dragged the shovel towards the firebox. He sniffled, unable to hold back the tears anymore. The engineer was so intimidating. Shovel that coal, Benjamin! Benjamin wiped his face and attempted to shovel the coal into the firebox. The coal only made it heavier, but he feared what the engineer would do to him if he failed to do as he was asked. With all of his strength, he put a small load into the firebox. Is that the best you can do, gate crasher? The conductor spat. Put your back into it, the engineer added. Benjamin dropped the shovel and covered his ears. These creatures yelling at him intimidated him, and he wanted to flee. The conductor grabbed him by his ear and flung him towards the engineer and the firebox before planting himself back at the door. Pick it up! He picked it up again. The snarl from the engineer was the signal to start scooping coal. The heat was horrible. It felt like he was at the gates of hell. After another scoop, he let out a cry and dropped the shovel. Splinters had stabbed into his hands and caused them to hurt and bleed. The engineer raised his hands like a gorilla ready to strike. Benjamin let out another cry and rushed full force towards the conductor. He slammed into his middle and knocked him backwards. He leapt over him and scrambled out as the conductor tried to reach him. Get back here, he roared. No one leaves a train until its last stop, the engineer called after him. The conductor grabbed at Benjamin's shoes. His laces were undone and were just enough for the conductor to grab. Down he went with a yell and braced his fall with his hands. 
Now the conductor had him by his ankle and dragged him back towards him. You're not going anywhere, Benjamin, he laughed wickedly. You're going to go on one hell of a ride. No, he cried as he shut his eyes tightly. He felt as if he was suspended in an eternity. It was as if everything went quiet, but then he felt the pulling on his ankle cease. He opened his eyes and noticed a pair of blue legs just in front of him. He glanced behind him and saw a shovel, spade stuck into the floor between the conductor's arm and hand, severing it at the wrist. Barely holding the handle was... Stewart! And he wasn't just any station master. It, he was like them! He had a skull for a head with dark, deep eyes and glowing pupils. You! Benjamin, get off the train, he ordered as the whistle blew. Hurry while you still have a chance. Benjamin scrambled to his feet and clumsily ran from the train back to the pier. He stumbled on his way off and tripped forward onto the wooden planks, scraping himself. All aboard, he heard the conductor's voice echo as he saw the demons on the train leaning out the windows to laugh and point at him. Benjamin scooted backwards with a wide-eyed whimper. The whistle blew again as the train began to chug along and move along the tracks. A gloved hand touched his shoulder. He paled and let out a cry as he spun around. You all right, Benjamin? Yo, Stuart, you're just like them. You're all skeletal, you monster. That train is the Grim Reaper, Stuart explained. Everyone that works with it is also a Grim Reaper. That train is the train that takes the dead to the other world. Yes, I work with the train. I usher the souls onto it. You were trying to kill me! No, Benjamin. You were trying to kill you. I'm just the station master. The choice to board the train was yours. The cars are like coffins. The engine is the heat of hell. And the caboose is the memories of life left behind. But you're off of it now. He pulled the boy to his feet and looked him over. Benjamin still felt the intimidation of staring this reaper in the face. Come inside. Let's get you cleaned up. Inside the empty train station, Stuart placed a band-aid on the now clean scrape on Benjamin's face. There we go. Thanks, Benjamin sighed. Why did you come after me, Stuart? I mean, if you collect souls, why would you let one get away? For one, you didn't get your ticket that you paid for, he replied. Besides, I don't think you are really ready to ride. Benjamin lowered his head with a frown. Thanks. That was horrible. More horrible than dealing with your parents? Benjamin arched a brow and glanced at him. Excuse me? You know, Benjamin, parents sometimes make mistakes, but they have good intentions. They're doing the best they can to make life successful and rewarding for you. Perhaps you should put more effort forth to do the best that you can, too. Sometimes when we are young, we just can't see the big picture. Can parents sometimes not see it, too? Stuart gave a nod. Yes, people only have one life to live, Benjamin. They only get that one chance to learn from experience. Sometimes they make mistakes, but meanwhile, sometimes they need help. So I should help them? Help me? He asked. Oh, that would be very nice of you. So what do you say? Think you can give yourself and your parents another chance? They'll ground me if they find out. Maybe. But maybe you could open up to them. Life can seem really hard sometimes. But getting through those times will make you stronger. The lessons you take from them will take you farther in life. 
I guess, Benjamin sighed as he rubbed the back of his neck. You know, you're an okay guy. You'd make some kid a good dad. If you weren't so ugly. Stuart let out a heavy laugh. Dead people have dead families, Benjamin. He playfully bonked him on the head with his hand. Beauty is nothing visible in my world. So enjoy your world for as many years as you can. Anything you live through is better than the misery you would have experienced on that long black train. Hey, will I ever see you again? Hopefully not for a very, very long time, Stuart replied as he placed the pickle jar of money into Benjamin's lap. By then, let's hope you take the light train instead of the late train. Trust me, the train you should be taking is a whole lot more pleasant than that. Benjamin gave a nod and took up his backpack. He slung it over his shoulder and smiled. Thanks a lot, Stuart. You're an okay guy, like I said. I think I'm ready to go home. Tell your old lady she makes a good lunch. Stuart let out a chuckle, making it more obvious that he was indeed smiling. That's good, Benjamin. I will. You head home, and you get back into bed. After a night like this, you could use the rest. Yes, sir, the boy nodded. He took hold of the pickle jar and rushed out to where he had left his bike. Stuart stood up and watched him ride off into the distance before taking up a broom and starting to sweep. Futures are uncertain. Trying to take them into your own hands... It does not make it any more predictable. Everyone needs patience. That boy could have been the one we were looking for. But he has his own life to live with his real family. Really, that makes me far happier than the chance to steal him away. No child that can help it deserves to be on that runaway train to nowhere. Okay, so what to say about this story? I kept listening to the song Long Black Train. I forget who sings it offhand. But I kept listening to it over and over and over again. And it just gave me this idea. And at the time, I had been wanting to work on a series of stories that dealt with death gods and grim reapers. And I kind of did that for The Revenants of Embry. But this particular story doesn't have anything to do with that. Though there is a version that is in the world of Embry and I think it's uh, a little more exciting, a, lo a little bit longer of a story. But this is the, f the first time I tried writing it in a more quote-unquote realistic universe. I always imagined it taking place in like Indiana... Or something like that in the 1940s or something. I don't know. It just, it just kind of came came to me with that kind of vision. And there's really not much else to say about that. It was just basically an, an idea that came to mind from listening to a song over and over and over again. And I just went with it. That's pretty much the story behind it. 